psychotherapy too. I mean, okay, welcome back, it's folks. Uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, about light therapy. One of the popular, heavy, it's definitely heavily marketed. Uh, this this light therapy, which for those who don't know, is essentially uh, people would sit in front of a lamp, and I guess these lamps would mimic the UV produced by the sun. And the idea is that by absorbing that UV, you're going to generate the vitamin D and potential serotonin, and that's going to you know help you deal with your seasonal affective disorder. Now. I don't know. I'm, I've read the internet a little bit. There's kind of two sides to the to the coin. What do you what do you think, Sarah? Is this legitimate or is this a, a pseudoscience? These light. I would say that there. it's legitimate. Um, yeah. From my understanding, okay. there's there's good scientific research backing it up. And um, as Scott was saying, you know, it's since about the 1980s that this has been researched. So there's a, a lot of years of uh, good evidence. And uh, there's been studies done where it uh, has a comparable effect to antidepressants, such as uh, Prozac, but with wow. light therapy, it actually um, kicked in. It worked more quickly. Is that Sometimes so? results can be seen within two or four days of starting it. Two or four days? Yeah. That's incredible. Uh -huh. uh, are you of the same opinion then, Scott? Yes, according yeah. to okay. our Canadian guidelines, this is a first line treatment. Yeah meaning that's a reasonable first treatment if so you have standard, seasonal so yeah okay. yeah that would be a for mild to moderate depression yeah. that would be a legitimate first choice uh, to for treatment however i would like to make a few comments about the mechanism of action mm -hmm. this is actually not thought to work through uv light now oh, sunlight so. delivers full spectrum light of course uh, the sad lights are very bright they should be about 10,000 lux. Now apparently a lux is the light emitted from a single candle flame. Uh, so if you imagine 10,000 candles. It's a few candles. Uh, say uh, two to three feet in front of your face, that's very, very bright. Mm -hmm. So the high quality sad lights are actually designed to have a very limited spectrum. It's an incandescent spectrum. Okay. So that it will have the biological effects of light without the risks that would come with that UV exposure. Oh, I see. I such see. as getting a sunburn uh, okay, gotcha. or uh, potentially increasing a risk of uh, cataract, uh, for example. Okay. Uh, thanks for clearing that up. Uh, I think if people jump online, they might be a little bit confused about uh, that. Very easily, because yeah. there are a lot of these lights that are marketed as being natural light, mm -hmm. which actually shouldn't be your first choice, because then you are exposing yourself to very bright UV light, similar to a tanning bed. Uh, which course. does have some risks. Certainly, uh, you know, widely known risks by now as well. Uh, I would say also, if you look online and you're looking at different lights, there are a number of inexpensive ones that only deliver 5,000 lux. And there's some debate about whether that intensity is enough. It really should be 10,000 lux. It kind of begs, begs the question, why are these products on the market? I mean, I, I, it's probably just a lack of people, or I guess a governing body policing. But that's, I mean, this is tough because people are suffering and they think they're helping themselves. Their doctor might tell them, go out and get a lamp and 5,000 bucks, what's the point type thing? Yes, indeed. The way they're regulated, it's up to the consumer to be careful about the specs mm -hmm. of what they purchase. And hopefully a doctor making a diagnosis will be particular about it needing 10,000 lux. Is it fair to say that most doctors are educated when it comes to equipment like this, do you think? I would um, hope so, and it, you know, just at least in that basic um, prescription that it needs to be 10,000 lux. If you keep that in mind, yeah. that's already a really good starting yeah, point. Yeah, I guess just read, read the fine print, right? Mm -hmm. Like anything else. Mm -hmm. um, now, depression uh, is said to be predominantly hereditary in, in general. I guess uh, 40 to 50 percent of, of cases, people have depression, it runs in the family. Can that be said for SAD as well, Scott? Uh, you know, I would say depression has many contributing causes. Yeah. So genetic uh, vulnerability is one of them. And the season, uh, seasonal changes are another. Mm -hmm. Early life events, events are another. Uh, traumas for during childhood, for example, adversities during childhood are another. Yeah. Uh, there are drugs that are risk factors for depression. There are physical conditions that are risk factors for depression. Um, it's, it's just too, it's too wide a spectrum. It's complicated. Yeah, certainly. There certainly. are many contributing causes. So, so Sarah, women are eight times more likely uh, to suffer from seasonal affective disorder uh, than men. Why? Why is that? 
I'm not sure that um, there is research or that there's conclusions about that yet. Is that so? Is it some bogus? Did I read, did I read some bogus science? I mean, I, are you familiar with these numbers? That I've not heard an eight to one ratio. Because that seems huge um, to me. Yeah. Yeah. In the at the younger end of the age range, is about a two to one ratio for most forms of depression, and that gets smaller as people get older. And that's two to one women to men. Yeah. Uh, at the younger end of the age range. Okay. Once you get into the seniors, you know, 65, 70, 75, uh, the sex difference becomes very small. Some even argue that men have a higher prevalence at the advanced ages, like say That's 80 plus. Wow, really. Is there other, uh, I guess, higher risk groups other than, I guess, young women? In our society, a specific demographic that can expect to suffer or you can expect to see suffer from SAD or is it kind of across the spectrum until you get a little bit older. Well, in addition to being a woman, between, being between the ages of 20 and 40 yeah. is where there's uh, more people um, affected. Of course, being further away from the equator is right. a risk factor, as is having um, someone, a close family member, who has um, struggles from disorder as another risk factor. Uh, so what are some of the, the more traditional treatment options for SAD? We talked about the uh, the lamps, uh, obviously, I guess um, the psychotherapy would right. be one. Yeah. I would think of pharmaceuticals. Is that fair to say? Am I missing anything there? Or is that kind of the gamut? Um, in broad strokes, for you know, that would that w those would be uh, three categories of mainstream treatments. Yeah. Now, physical exercise was also mentioned. Sure which is a legitimate treatment option for mild to moderate depression. There's also several forms of evidence-based psychotherapy, as well as many different um, types of medications that are used. It's a, it's, a, it's a big topic, isn't it? It surely is. Folks, we're gonna jump uh, away for a moment and check in with the Rant Pack. Stay with us. Uh, the thing about uh, depression in general, it's it's having a support group, or and the people that you can count on. So my my thoughts about depression is knowing that I have families and some friends that I can uh, work with that can help me work on my depression and just there's just so much that can come up with it. So knowing that you have a, a support system is probably the best thing for anybody that's dealing with depression, um, whether you're young or older. So I really find that reaching out to people that are in a similar, um, a similar path as you are, knowing that you can relate to a lot of things, knowing that it's hard for everybody, but with the friends, it it's, makes everything so much easier. So Scott, you're saying during the break we should probably clarify uh, regarding the the mood lamps, uh, light therapy. They shouldn't be used by people with bipolar disorder, is that right? Why is yes. that? Yes, well that's really the main risk with this treatment uh, for people with a bipolar disorder. Now that that's a condition where people experience recurring depressions, but also episodes of mood elevation, okay. which can be very problematic, uh, called manic or hypomanic episodes. And it's well known that the light therapy c can trigger manic episodes in people with bipolar disorder. So let's make that clear. Yeah. Yeah, they have yeah. to be very cautious about the okay. use of this treatment. Okay. No, no, well spoken, uh, Sarah. Tell me uh, a bit about your practice. So uh, somebody comes in, they're, I guess, concerned they're suffering from uh, from sad. Yeah. Um, you know, you've taken a, a contemplative psychotherapy approach to things. You're full, I guess gamut of treatment. If I'm coming in the door, how are you going to treat me? Well, so um, in terms of psych uh, positive psychotherapy, therapeutic interventions, um, the main one would be CBT, Cognitive Behavioral ther Therapy, yes. or Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Behavioral, behavioral Therapy. Behavioral Therapy. It's a yeah. bit of a mouthful, yeah, right. certainly. Um, and, and what that entails is um, sort of examining the content of your thoughts. So for example, um, having the person identify um, problematic thoughts such as like I'm a failure for not completing my uh, project on time and then finding evidence that supports that yeah. and maybe evidence against that and then seeing if you can come to a different conclusion. So this is that's a CBT? Yeah. 
Okay. And then if you incorporate a little bit of the, more of the mindfulness, you would also um, have the person examine when they hold that first belief, I am a failure, what is that like in their body? There's probably a sense of weight, okay. of hopelessness. And then when you shift and find a more positive belief, the person might feel a little bit more um, confidence, a little bit lighter. So just also incorporating a bit more of the body is mm -hmm. when you incorporate the mindfulness. Is there, is there any room for, and I'm a bit of a layman, meditation, uh, some kind of I, almost alternative therapies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's really good research showing that uh, mindfulness-based uh, therapies are really good for depression. So basically mindfulness is um, becoming aware of what's happening in the present moment. So kind of the opposite of autopilot where you're just going through life. Which so um, many of us do so frequently, of course, yeah. Right, yeah. and then in mindfulness therapy, you, um, you, you start to change your relationship to thoughts. You start to um, watch them, so you develop an observer. And so at some point you start to recognize that the thoughts are not only, you, you're capable of thinking anything. There's um, thoughts come and go constantly, mm. and you just keep trying to focus on the breath. And once you start to shift your relationship to thoughts, when you have a thought such as, um, this is hopeless, I'm never gonna feel better, um, you don't necessarily have to believe that. There's mm -hmm. a mindfulness slogan that says, don't believe everything you think. I like so, that, yeah. 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 Uh, does this mean that you're, you know, as a, as a psychiatrist, obviously, are you more prone towards pharmaceuticals or do you sort of respect and appreciate and maybe in practice a little bit about, uh, or a little bit what Sarah would bring to her patients as oh, well? Oh yeah, um, both of those modalities, the cognitive, classical cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based therapy are both considered uh, first-line okay. options okay, yeah. for depression. Uh, I think both clinical psychologists and psychiatrists get some training in all in these areas. I hope so, that's good. It's a requirement for the licensure of uh, psychiatrists as well as clinical psychologists. There's also a literature that would suggest that if you're going to be doing one of these forms of therapy, there's a lot to be said for experience and expertise and sort of focus in that area. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, there are therapists from different disciplines who will focus in a particular style of therapy and become skilled and uh, knowledgeable, comfortable with its techniques. Uh, final question, if somebody believes that they may be suffering from seasonal affective disorder, what's you know, your, your one piece of advice that you would give them? Maybe Sarah, I'll start with you. I think that if it is um, significantly impacting their life, it's important to get professional help, not just to go online and to get a mood lamp. Don't self-diagnose, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. If it's just really, if it's just a bit of winter blues, just feeling down, it might be okay to get more sunlight and get a sun lamp. But if it's uh, markedly impacting your life, and absolutely if there's any suicidal thoughts, yeah. yeah to go see your doctor or a registered psychologist. Strong advice. I imagine you would probably mirror just I that, Scott. I would certainly yeah. agree with that. Um, there's a still a stigmatization related to these conditions, so one of the things that keeps people from seeking help is a, sort of a sense of shame, that yeah. it's a sign of weakness. Really or unfortunate. Something, it is, yeah. it, it's terrible. Yeah. Uh, destructive, that's not the way you want to be thinking about this. This is a health issue, a manageable one. Yeah. Get the help you need. Absolutely. Excellent, guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here today. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Folks, that's all our time for this evening. As per usual, you can get at us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you've got a show idea, by all means, don't be a stranger. Until next time, take care.